This is Ian from Military Gun, and we're here at our Berlin show at Cassiopeia with Evil Greed. The lucky thing that we had going for us was that um, Military Gun existed from March of 2020 until August of 21 without ever playing a show. So to be in a band, the only thing we could do is practice and write. And because of that, we wrote the demo, All Roads Lead to the Gun and Life Under the Gun before we ever played a show. So before our first show, every single song on Life Under the Gun was already recorded. And so because of that, we had nothing else to do. And it, it was like really was all one creative like vomit period. And then when shows started, it broke up that creative vomit and made it, now it's kind of a little bit of a different approach, but for the most part trying to chase, keeping it exactly the same, just to be like, like a no pressure completely intuitive and um, like interest-based, you know, like not overthinking anything about the process. It's about just trying to keep it as like childlike songwriting as possible. Just like don't think about it and um, try to just vomit it out and then move on to the next song. Like, uh, and I don't think that that's really changed from the beginning of the band. So now maybe there's a little bit more intention on honing in on melody a little bit more but even then it, if it's not in the first draft it it's not good you know it's like it's it doesn't make it you know going into the first full length i don't think there was like a again it was like they were written some of the songs overlap you know like very high was written before even songs like Ain't No Flowers. Like, so that, like, that song was written so early and felt like it was going to be a bigger song than what we were capable of achieving at the time that we wrote it. So we saved it and got better as a band to achieve like what the idea of that song was, you know? And so um, it really was just kind of the big mark of the difference in time period, which is pretty funny and corny to talk about is we literally recorded All Roads Lead to the Gun, and then I started uh, a job delivering weed like the next day. And my job, my life became full time just driving and listening to music. So I was just listening to a lot more music on a daily basis. So it was just like studying, you know, just like studying day in, day out, and then being like, oh, I've never heard this record by this band, or this band says this record's influential to them. So I'm gonna listen to the records they find inspiring. And so it just was like eight to 12 hours a day that I was just devoting to just listening to music. And because of that, it made me feel like very creatively anxious. So I like every day when, we stop, when I stopped working, I like had to pick up a guitar or make a demo or do something because I just was overfilling with uh, inspirations. You know, like I just was listening to so much that I was like, I need to make something like that. And I miss that period because now it's, you know, like we play a show every day. We're, we're constantly surrounded by music that is not uninspiring, but just less, you know, it's not, um, it's not classic records, class, you know, all the time, you know. So. It's a lot of just like mainstream rock that I overlooked or, or cla a lot of classic rock because I've, I've just really loved classic rock for quite some time and yeah just kind of going through and being like okay this who record they do this trick um like a big thing that we take from classic rock is the is, is the drum beat that we use a lot it's and do it faster gak gak gaku gaku gak gak if you listen to like the kinks you listen to uh the who you listen to pretty much any classic rock bands that went on to be like arena bands like they have that beat and then a lot of really amazing 90s music has that same beat and so it was kind of like, oh, there's like magic. Like this, this beat makes me want to jump up and down. And um, 
Yeah, I, as far as specific records, like I got really into the strokes. Like, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't really, that's a sound that's not very relevant to what military gun is, but I was finding it very inspiring. And I think I've very much learned to develop as a singer by just singing along to Julian Casablancas. Like that's where a lot of the low register stuff that we do, um, like Will Logic specifically, was a song where I sang in my low register at the very beginning of the song, and that was meant that was me trying to do Julian Casablancas. And then like the like really gravelly talking part, like it's a strain, nothing's changed in the bridge. That was like my girlfriend liked a specific part on the newest Strokes record, and she was like, "You should do a gravelly talking part like that." And so she inspired that. She's like, "This, I'm very susceptible to people saying you should try this, and then I'll just try it." And usually they have great ideas. So. I felt like it was an important time to talk about making mistakes because I think the way that people, culture at large was talking about mistakes, which is a thing that we're all doing on a daily basis. It's not, it doesn't, you know, you don't suddenly never make a mistake again, you know? Um, and so I just felt like there was such a lack of self-awareness in the culture of the way people talked about other people's mistakes. And so it was very important to me to talk about me making mistakes, me hurting people, me talking about my own lack of self-awareness and the way that that lack of self-awareness goes on to hurt somebody else. You don't think that you are hurting somebody and then you look back at it and you find out that you very much did. And I think that it's very rare that people are evil and like try to hurt people. It's very, you know, like you could think about in your life, you, you probably don't think you've ever intentionally gone out to hurt somebody but someone carries pain that you've caused them. And so, you know, I just was like very much trying to reference that. And there's a song that got cut from the record that really summed up the, and the, the chorus um, was the things that you'll never remember are the things I'll never forget. And that's kind of like my general thesis on the idea of hurting other people is that it's a, done in carelessness, it's not done in malice. And um, that being said, you have to acknowledge the way you carry yourself, you know, and, uh, and hopefully not, not make those same mistakes in the future. So um, yeah, it was very important. And, and at the same time, like, I wanted to talk about regret from a third person as well, of, of witnessing someone else's regret, the idea that you make mistakes and it becomes your identity. And approaching that with some sympathy and and you know like people are being taken to task for things they've done 10 years previous we don't know if they have changed in that time maybe they haven't I think a lot of people probably haven't because they don't realize the weight of their decisions but at the same time the idea that you live a life and suddenly that life is completely changed because it comes back to haunt you is, is a very it could happen to anybody so why not have some sympathy for it? And so I just thought, you know, like with growing influence, I could approach um, the topic in a different way. You know, like Pat, Pat Kinlan from Drug Church, he, if, through self-defense and Drug Church, he criticizes the culture. And I felt I wanted to be more self-critical and talk about it from a more human thing instead of like, oh, you guys are so stupid judging other people. I didn't want to talk about that element. I wanted to instead like appeal to the emotional element of the culture surrounding mistakes. Um, yes, the gun changes per record, like whatever that gun is, you know? Um, but definitely the gun that, that was lived under her for this was, uh, was, was mistakes, was, was regret, was um, trauma that other people have put upon me and that I've put upon others. So yeah, that was very much the gun in that situation. The challenge for me for the re for this record was singing. It was elevating. If, if you pay attention to the guitar work, it's not dissimilar from All Roads Lead to the Gun in the demo, but the big 
leap forward to me is the attention to detail on the vocals and the vocal melodies and trying to improve um, in that way and making the, especially with trying to approach heavier topics, it was so much about how do I make that digestible and fun. Uh, like a song you never fucked up once could have been about, it could have been a love song or something, it's very poppy, but instead I wanted to put all of the meaning and intention of the record into the poppiest song so that it's easier to digest. And um, that was it, was, it was fun finding the balance of saying the right amount of crazy things, you know, like biting back, like seizure of assets, like it's like trying to be like a third eye blind song, but, and similar to th th what third eye blind did too. I mean, like, I think there's some depth to that record that is very bizarre, you know, to the third eye blind self-titled. And, you know, he's talking about doing drugs and the, poppiest song, you know, like, uh, and so it's like very much chasing that balance of uh, like the abrasiveness and the poppiness, like very high early on when we didn't have it right yet. I referred to our guitar, told our guitar player, Will, I was like, it's right now it's a Barbie doll, but we need to melt half of its face, you know, like, and that was the balance we aspired to uh, with all of it is it's like, it should be pretty and poppy, but it needs to be melted and fucked up. Okay, my very first interaction with hardcore was the Atticus comp. So the Atticus comp had American Nightmare AM PM on it. Um, but I think they got sued right around the time that the comp came out. So me being in like fifth grade, I was trying to find American Nightmare because it was my favorite song on the compilation, but it was living next to the Mighty Mighty Boss Stones. It was next to Alkaline Trio, Blink-182. So for me, there wasn't a differentiation between all these things. It was pop, pop punk, emo, and hardcore in one place. I never, to this day, I've never heard an American Nightmare record because I never found them at that moment that I was looking for it, which I'm glad because fifth grade was too early to get into hardcore anyway. Um, but that was the first time and then slowly over time, you know, I'd be like, oh, um, in seventh grade, I got into Kill Your Idols randomly because they were kind of affiliated with like the pop punk stuff that I liked. Um, and then my first like har hardcore, hardcore show was in March 2007, and I went to see Ceremony, Trash Talk, and Allegiance. And it changed my life because it was like, it was a floor show. People were, I was jumping off of tables onto people. I took my shirt off and fucking like went insane, and I'm like 15 years old. And, um, but at the same time, like the way my friends and I were listening to music, we were listening to Modest Mouse, and we were listening to Ceremony. We're listening to Charles Bronson, and we're listening to like the ska band Pain that for some reason we all really love that like I try to talk to people about and nobody knows for some reason. But you know, it was like so much ingesting like this, these versions of like emo and pop punk and you know, it was, it was Jawbreaker. And, and at that time specifically, hardcore kids got into Jawbreaker. It's very funny because I think the difference between this moment in hardcore and the, my first moments in hardcore was that people would go and they'd make their different band from their hardcore band. So it'd be like, oh, these are the hardcore, hardcore guys doing their Jawbreaker band. Um, where now people are like, oh, I'm gonna do a hardcore band, but like incorporate Jawbreaker or Who's Could Do or whatever, you know, and like take these more melodic elements and put them in a blender and see what results. And I think that coming from Title Fight and things like that, like that led towards this moment of kind of genre ag agnosticism where it's, it's more so a rejection of the idea that there needs to be lines and rules. I think it's gonna swing back the other way very soon. I think that the schism between like what people are gonna view as like real, like hardcore, I think it's gonna, it's gonna it has to swing back towards traditionalism. It has to, in my opinion. Like it's just the way that it's always been. There's gonna be a new set of younger kids who are like, that shit's lame as fuck, like fuck Military Gun and all these other bands with vocal melodies, you know? Um, and that's their right. I probably, I could have been one of those kids if I'm, if I was just younger, you know, like, um, but yeah, I don't know. 
I think the moment is a great one because I think people are just motivated towards writing great songs. And um, I think at the same time, there's also bands who don't actually have a creative bone in their body that hear the melodicism happening elsewhere. And then they're like, okay, that's what everyone's doing. Let's try that. And that's what's going to ultimately burst the bubble of the moment is all these bands that really have nothing going on up top attempting to do what the bands who, uh, you know, like Justice from Angel Dust is actually, you know, an, an amazing musical mind. Does not mean everybody should try what Justice is trying, you know, so. Uh, I mean, right now I've been listening to a lot of Elliott Smith. Um, I, my favorite record of the year is Bully, Lucky For You. It's, it's hard because I don't like turn on too many like straight up hardcore records very often. I really like Mexican Coke from um, Texas. Uh, Gel is incredible. They played, the, played here and sold it out. And I mean, they're taking over the world. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of uh, bands who have like crazy industry things happening. But as far as my opinion, bands that are just like sh straight up fucking hardcore punk music, like Gel is like one of the biggest bands out there. And, and it's for good reason. It's because they're like a true fucking hardcore band. They are what people need to hear. And the great thing is I don't think they're gonna, they're not gonna be adding vocal melodies and, and trying to chase uh, any of the things. They're just gonna keep making amazing hardcore songs. I've been trying to listen through Kurt Cobain's list of, he made a list of 50 of his favorite records, but it's kind of challenging because I think he likes the worst records by really great bands. Uh, like it's kind of like the Breeders record that's on the list. I'm like, this is not the best Breeders record at all. Like what the fuck is, why pod? You know, like um, there's a really random Beatles cover on it. That's like not, why would you cover Happiness is Warm Done? No diss to the Breeders, I love you, but why did Kurt put that on the list? Um, if I could, ah, my phone is over there, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm trying to, I guess it only matters the stuff I can think of off top. I mean, we are about to release music and I've been listening to the music we're about to release. I've been listening to a lot of our demos. Um, you sure? Let's see what I've been listening to. Okay. Uh, oh, I've been listen I listen to the Green Day demos a lot. Those were a revelation. Lana Del Rey is my, my favorite artist. And I've been trying to listen to Honeymoon and Blue Banisters because I don't know either of those records, but I'm, they're neither are clicking with me like at all. But I am obsessed with uh, There's a Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, and I've been listening to a lot of Ultraviolence. The new Spiritual Cramp LP, incredible. Oh, I've been listening to a lot of Vampire Weekend. None of this is hardcore. People are going to hate me after this. I love the Olivia Rodrigo record. <laughs> I don't love all the songs, but uh, like there's like six amazing songs on that record. Um, okay, wait, here's even better. That was my recently added. I'm gonna go to my recently played. Um, oh, Alex G. Yeah, it's not very subversive these days. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to the Andy Warhol, the Velvet Underground. Not too much, a lot of Juice World. <laughs> So yeah, not too much hardcore in, in my recent playlist. So, a lot of pop music. I love pop music. So we have an EP where we re-recorded four songs from the LP and completely changed everything about them besides the vocal melodies. And we have Bully, Mannequin Pussy and Manchester Orchestra on that, and we did a NoFX cover. So it's, uh, oh, I've been listening to a lot of NoFX. That's what I've been listening to. I love NoFX. But yeah, we have this thing, and we, uh, we did this record with this guy, Shooter Jennings, uh, and it was, you know, it, we were <laughs> a mad dash. Like, my time off between tours was, we got home from Europe, and I instantly got into the studio to work on this. And then on the off days, I'm going and making brand new songs and demoing those with people. And then coming back and doing more with the record. I don't want the, the blade to get dull. So, so the big thing is trying to 
keep it going and, and not um, wait around. And I'm honestly still overflowing with ideas. So it's like, how do I capture the ideas in the um, moments that I have time? And we have an acoustic guitar on this tour and like on our off days, I've been demoing on my phone. So it's like trying to keep it moving and and you know we don't want it with having to tour so much we don't want it to be like oh we get to the end of the tour cycle oh shit we need to write a record like i want to have recorded a record before this tour cycle even ends because um i feel like that's the way our momentum feels and so it's just about getting all of, you know we have over in lps worth of demos we probably have about 15 or 16 currently and when we get to about 30 then then we'll whittle it down to 12. The goal is to not uh, get, uh, to let my mind go dull. You know, just like keep making it, keep getting better. And, and uh, anytime, if, if the inspiration is there, don't be lazy, capture it that moment. That's the big thing is like, you get to the hotel on an off day and you're like, oh, I just want to like w look at my iPad. Yeah, I want to watch TV. But no, if you feel, if you were motivated earlier in the day, try to go back to that motivation and, and capture it.